Hi everyone, welcome to the Aperture lesson. My name is Zoe Tessier and I have been teaching with the Art Students League for about four years now and I've been teaching photography for about six years. So I actually teach in a high school setting and <clears throat> this is a very basic photography lesson involving Aperture. So I'm actually just gonna share my screen with you and show you a couple slides to go over just the basics of Aperture. You can kind of become familiar with what it looks like when we're using Aperture. And then we're gonna go ahead and try and find it in our phones or our cameras that we're using. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. So one more shot, share screen. Okay, here we go. Okay. So we're first just gonna go ahead and jump right into this slideshow here. And so aperture. So we'll look at our phone in just a moment uh, with how we can find that f-stop setting. But really what aperture is, is it's a part of this lens and through the lens on our phones um, or in our DSLR cameras, there is a little opening that um, opens and shuts uh, depending on speed. It's usually with shutter speed but the aperture is the amount of light that's let in and kind of the focal point, if that's how you wanna look at it. So the first thing that you'll see here are these different numbers of f-stops, okay? So it's kind of strange with photography, the lower the f-stop number, the higher the opening is, okay? So really just kind of observe what's going on on this shared screen and so the lower the number, the higher the opening. So the smaller the number, the more light is let in. Okay. So as you can see, again, that smaller the number, the larger the opening. And you can also see with this higher f-stop here, the smaller the opening, the darker the photograph is. So again, just basic observations with f-stops and aperture. So I'm just gonna give you a moment to go ahead and look at these images and make your basic observation. And really the difference that's found between them is you will see with this F1.8, this larger opening, okay? The person in the foreground, the closest object to you is blurry. The object in the middle ground is focused. And the object in the, in the background is gonna be blurry again. Then with this f-stop, f8, the lens is closed a little bit more. And this person in the foreground, so closest object to you, is a little bit more in focus. The object in the furthest in the background is a little bit more in focus. And then again, the person in the middle ground stays the same. Okay. So with this f2, as you can see, the lens has closed a little bit more and all objects or all people in the foreground, middle ground, and background are all focused. So you'll hear people describe different depths of field when we're talking about aperture. 
you'll hear them say either it has a very deep depth of field or a really shallow depth of field. So again, just a lot of information being thrown at you. Uh, you can watch this video again and hopefully understand it again if you need to. But again, I'm not trying to give you too much information. It's really just combining all the terms that photographers use along with the settings in our camera that we will figure out how to use too. Okay, so really here we're just looking again at the numbers. So the higher the f-stop, the smaller your opening is for your lens. I kind of like to tell students, describe it as, you know, if it's being um, really light out, you kind of squint your eyes. Um, and it will, it will make sense when we look at lighting. So as far as this bigger f-stop number, smaller the lens, the more focused the picture is, it will be a little bit darker and it will go way far as um, everything being really in focus. Okay, so it can hit a really deep depth of field. The higher we go with the lens opening, the smaller the f-stop as you've seen before, the more blurry the background will become. Your object in the foreground will become focused, same focused all the way through. And the photograph will be brighter. Your eye, think of your eye being wide open, letting all the light in. And you're gonna shoot with a lower f-stop with that shallow depth of field, okay? And to kind of get that blurry background. So here we can just look at the difference of the photographs. So if you're out walking at one of the parks, um, or just maybe shooting some still life photography in your home. F-stop is really, really great when you just wanna focus on either one area that you really love and blur the background. So you're gonna use a lower F-stop in that scenario. Or maybe you wanna capture pieces of the park that you're walking in along with the flower. Okay, so whatever you're shooting, so to get everything in the entire picture plane here, you're gonna use that higher f-stop number to just focus on one object, kind of blur out the background so your viewer doesn't have too much information to look at. You're gonna go with that lower f-stop number. So my goal here with this lesson is to really give you the tools to know looking at any photograph which aperture f-stop they are using. Okay. So in these photographs, these three photographs, I've given you different f-stops that this different photographers would be using. So when you have a little bit of that blur in the foreground, but you still have the focus in the middle ground, and you might have a little bit of blur in the background, that's gonna be a middle f-stop setting, okay? So it's really in between that f1.8 and the f22. It might be like an f16 or even an f5.6, okay? So that's gonna be that one. Your f-stop being used in this professional photograph is going to be a really low f-stop because the object sitting in the foreground, the closest thing to you, is in focus, but everything in the background is blurry. So it's going to be maybe an f1.8, maybe an f2.8. It could even potentially be maybe an f4.0, but it just depends on the lens that you're using. So your numbers are gonna change a little bit, but just remember it's gonna be a lower f-stop. Low, low f-stop. And we have another one here that everything is blurry in the foreground. You have the kind of captured image in the middle ground, and then you've got blurry in the background. So we just go back to this one and 
Mm, we might kind of do like an F16. This is object here is a really shallow depth of field. You can always even refer to this chart and say, okay, maybe a 5.6 for this deer sitting in the field. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of there. So real quick, let's go ahead and just try and find this setting in our phone or camera. So I'll come back on here with you. So the first thing I'm gonna actually show you is how to make sure your settings actually are gonna work with any editing programs such as Photoshop on your computer. So the way that we're gonna do that is we're just gonna open up our phones on your camera, it's already, already going to be set to the most compatible setting. But if you're using a program like Photoshop, you will want to use just the L setting. It's just the large, most versatile setting that's the most compatible with any editing program. Okay, so on your camera, this is gonna be a little different. Um, go ahead and check under your screen, under your main menu, in your DSLR camera, and you should be able to find a setting for the actual image size. And again, you just want an L. It's just a little triangle, um, L, large setting. So hopefully, if you can't find that, you just have the most compatible setting on your camera. So in your phone, I'm gonna just go under the app, the camera app. So instead of just hitting camera, I'm actually just gonna to go to settings. Okay, so that's gonna be that little silver dial. And I'm gonna scroll all the way down until I get to see my camera app. So sorry, there's kind of a glare in it, but I'm gonna hit my camera app. And then go to the very top that it says formats. And you wanna make sure it's clicked on the most compatible. That high efficiency file, when you take pictures using Aperture and you download it, you're gonna see the file format show up on your desktop, not as a JPEG, but as an HE, um, if dot file. Okay, and those are really, really hard for programs like Photoshop to read. So just be aware of that. You can always switch it back with our amazing phones these days. We can shoot in this high efficiency mode, uh, but unfortunately, it's not that compatible with editing programs and photographs. So I'm going to click most compatible. I always just keep mine on there so I can convert it into anything at any time. And then I'm just going to go ahead and go back to camera and get out of settings. So now I'm just going to go to my camera app on my main screen. And you're going to go ahead and scroll to um, portrait. Okay, so I'm under that portrait mode. Again, I'm sorry that this is kind of backwards on you. Okay, so give everyone just a minute to get there. We're going to portrait. Now on the top right hand corner, you're gonna see a little cursive F. Go ahead and click on that. And that is gonna be your aperture F stop. So I know that I'm on it because the little F, little cursive F looking thing has turned to yellow. And then on the bottom here, you can actually scroll back and forth. And all of your F stops are gonna change. So just know that 
Your f-stop numbers are going to be different inside, shooting any indoor photography, versus being outside. Okay? So you might see a way higher f-stop outside uh, because it's a little bit brighter, or it might be a lot uh, lower because it's dark outside. So just kind of pay attention to that with your different f-stops. So one thing that I do have students do when we have a little bit more time and we meet in person is I have students go out and shoot at the lowest f-stop and then they take 10 pictures going all the way up like the lowest f-stop and the highest f-stop and then one right in the middle and then kind of take different f-stop photos in between there and that's when they can really see when you look back at your different F settings photographs, that's when you can really see the difference in your F stop photographs. Okay. So one great way to practice this, and I'm gonna just show you one more presentation. Um, so, I always like to start with practicing my different aperture shots by trying out setting up a still life, okay? So we all have a ton of still life stuff at home. And of course the park and everything is great, but if you're kind of like, I wanna practice this, but I don't really even know what to take a picture of. We always have lots of food. We always have utensils or glasses or things in the kitchen. So again, that's always a great place to start to practice your aperture. So a couple just quick tricks and tips with setting up a still life is you wanna place your objects so they, they overlap just a little bit. Okay. And I always, always, always remind my students and I have to remind myself sometimes that we don't need to see everything, okay? So with these napkins going off to the side or dishcloths, we know that the napkin or dishcloth is not cut off right there. We know that it continues, but having things go off the picture plane allow for the viewer to kind of ponder what else is going on in the photograph. And it allows them to kind of connect with the photograph more because you're not giving them all the information all at once. The last thing here is try and be daring with your photographs. So get on top of it. You know, do a kind of a bird's eye view looking over your still life. The next one is to use stackable objects to get more depth, height, and definition to your composition. So any sort of little shoe box, a jewelry box, anything works. Try and set up your background so that there's not a whole lot of distraction. Like if you have your kids playing in the back and maybe a dog back there and you know some of your laundry and you're trying to do a really cool composition, really take into account everything that's going on in your picture plane, okay? So as much as we can mute out the background with a lower f-stop, right, we can blur it out. Sometimes it doesn't blur it out enough to our satisfaction. So just be aware of what's going on in the background. So you can always use a nice sheet or cover to put over on top. Okay. And if you really want to go outside the box, you can go ahead and grab some string. You could do this in a windowsill and just pull your, your shade or your blind down. And then with the string, you kind of just hang your objects down from above. So you get a really nice variety of um, height with your objects. Remember that lighting really creates a mood. So directional lighting is one that comes in from one angle and hits the object. That directional lighting makes a very dramatic feel. So again, we have really nice directional lighting here, and then we have some really nice cast shadows. If 
You can always try to choose different colors as they say opposites attract. <laughs> and so here we have um, our color scheme, one of the color schemes. So the opposite color schemes are red and green, so they say holiday colors. Yellow and purple are opposites, so those are gonna attract, so like a plum and a lemon. And then the last one I say are Broncos colors, so blue and orange. Okay, so it could be any type of fruit, um, you know, any bowl, anything that you can find. Again, this is just practicing, trying to take fun compositions of things. And then you can also practice just using a monochromatic color scheme. So you could just do like whites and creams with a pop of color, okay? And that's always really a nice, fun way to get just some excitement in the photograph, but keeping it not so crazy. Maybe you don't like having all of these colors. Again, this is your style of photography, so you have to do it the way that you find is the most interesting way. So always try and keep the viewer's eye flowing. So we talked about color in the last one, those opposite um, colors. Then we have to think about the height of things, right? So we want a variety of height. We don't want everything just laying flat on the table. And then again, no distraction in the background. Okay, so if you just have to use some sort of sheet, um, maybe just a plain white wall like I have behind me. <laughs> Go ahead and do that. And last, but definitely not least, uh, try and choose a variety of different objects. So try and find really fun fabrics that could be, um, you know, you could use like some sort of cardboard, you could use some sort of fluffy, furry fabric, um, you could use something kind of scratchy and rough. So just go around and feel, you know, different fabrics that are gonna be really fun. Even like aluminum foil is really fun because you can get the reflection from the bottom, you know, into the different glasses or into the different fabrics and things. So go ahead and choose something that's shiny, such as metal or glass. So we have a really nice shine with this glass here, a nice shine in here, and a nice shine in here. Try and choose one that's maybe dull and rough. So a cutting board is gonna be great. Any sort of wood is awesome for kind of that dull, rough texture. Wet is always wonderful because you get this awesome reflection inside of it. So this one might be, you know, really aimed towards some sort of cocktail, but you could choose, you know, um, to put your glass in water, maybe, you know, water in your sink or something to shoot. So you don't have to have just water confined in the cup. Okay. Go ahead and choose something smooth. So something like an apple would be great nice and smooth. Um, the texture of that bottle is gonna be nice and smooth. And maybe the cinnamon sticks is gonna be nice and smooth in there. And then again, reflection is an awesome thing to have because it kind of makes the viewer's eye pop around. So in this photograph, we're also shooting it with that shallow depth of field. We have directional lighting in it. And then the aperture mode here is gonna be really nice and low. Okay, so our aperture might be a 1.8. Okay, and the last thing here that I always, always, always wanna tell my students is always try and challenge yourself and think about where you can submit your photograph or any of your artwork to be seen. It's always, I try and submit my work places so people can see it and that I can also get a critique from people as well. So the one site that I love to go to and you may have heard of before is cafe.org or callforentry.org 
And I'll just go ahead and click on that so you can kind of see what it looks like. It's an awesome site for artists. Um, you can go ahead and find calls. Um, they do a lot of photography, call for entries. Um, I'll just show you right here. Oops. So they even have a photography one right here. And then you can also do sort by state. So I always try and do um, my stuff in Colorado just but now everything's kind of shifting around. So they do have one call right now, it looks like. Um, the Colorado Photographic Art Center. There's an entry fee of $5. So that's something you'd like to do. Um, but the last thing here too is there's so much food photography or sports aperture photography. All you have to do is just maybe type in like food magazines and you can see all of them, and you could submit your photograph to one of these and land your awesome aperture photograph on maybe the front of a magazine. So you never know how far it can go. And I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Uh, I wish I could answer any of your questions that you have, but again, feel free to watch this again and have fun shooting. Take care, bye-bye.